What if the Jedi Order rose up and joined the Rebellion? That is our story for today, and also I will be doing a lightsaber and a Lego set giveaway once we reach 50,000 subscribers on this channel, so be sure to subscribe and stick around to the end of the video to find out how to enter. Let's get right into it. Our story begins on a rocky moon, not far from the planet Jabim, as Obi-Wan Kenobi has cut through the mask and destroyed the center console of Darth Vader. After a long battle where Obi-Wan Kenobi found himself once more, and found a true purpose, he has defeated the man that was once Anakin Skywalker. But this is Anakin no more, it is Vader, and Vader is looking up at Obi-Wan with his burned eyes, wondering what Obi-Wan will do with this chance to destroy him. And Vader watched as Obi-Wan lifted his saber, preparing to swing down and end him, once and for all. And as he did, Vader's life flashed before his eyes. He saw himself for what he was in the face of death by the blade of his old master. He was a failure, not only as a Jedi, but as a husband, a father, and as a person. He remembered Padme, his unborn child, the Jedi Order. He gave in to his hatred, thinking it was the only way that he could ever become who he was supposed to be. But he was wrong. Day by day, Vader decayed as the dark side ripped him apart from the inside out. This was not truly living, and so as Obi-Wan held up the blade, Vader yelled at him to wait. They were both breathing heavily, and Anakin looked up at Obi-Wan and told his former master that he has won. Darth Vader is dead. He does not need to strike him down, and a wave of relief washed across Obi-Wan's face. Somehow, he could tell that Anakin was telling the truth. Vader was dead and Obi-Wan reached out a shaky hand, asking Anakin to come with him. That maybe he can fix everything, but Anakin only pushed the hand away. Instead, Anakin now told Obi-Wan that he must disappear and find himself. He has to find Anakin Skywalker again, and perhaps in due time he can join the fight. And to this, Obi-Wan stammered, saying that there is no fight. The Empire's grip is too strong, their fist closed too tight, their tyranny has no bounds. But Anakin told Obi-Wan that he is wrong. There is rebellion everywhere, but the Emperor has kept it quiet. Anakin said that there are cracks in the machine that is the Empire, and the Emperor is too arrogant to see it. And Anakin said that a rebellion would need a true leader. A rebellion would need Obi-Wan Kenobi. And Obi-Wan looked to Anakin, tears in his eyes, as he told Anakin something he'd never heard before. Padme's final words, which were, There is still good in him as she died. Anakin looked to the ground, remembering his wife. Through all of his flaws, she loved him, and Vader had killed her and the unborn child. Obi-Wan considered telling Anakin about Luke and Leia, but now was not the time. And so now Anakin slowly stood up, telling Obi-Wan to let his death as Vader be the spark that will light the fire that will ultimately burn down the Empire. Obi-Wan and Anakin shared one final look, and they went their separate ways. Sometime later, on Dagobah, Yoda was meditating in the trees as he felt a large shift in the Force. He was searching in the Force for what this shift was, but he could not figure it out. Luckily, he didn't have to, as a small ship descended down nearby, and Yoda could certainly feel in the Force who was here, Obi-Wan Kenobi. Yoda slowly walked over to the ship as Obi-Wan walked down the ramp and looked at Yoda with a smile that Yoda had grown fond of during the Clone Wars. It was a smile that faded as the years went by, but something clearly happened to make Obi-Wan feel this hope once more. And Obi-Wan would greet Yoda, then sit down and begin telling Yoda everything. The sounds, smells, and overall feeling of Dagobah was wet and eerie, and Obi-Wan almost preferred it to the hot sands of Tatooine. Almost. But he told Yoda that Princess Leia was captured by Inquisitors, and so he left Tatooine for the first time to find her. In his mission, he saw the state of the galaxy, and how the Empire is ruling over the people. The peace that the Empire promised the galaxy has turned into a reign of terror for anyone who dares oppose them. The people are terribly oppressed, forced to work for the Imperial Machine or die and be forgotten. And perhaps worst of all, the greatest hero of the Jedi during the Clone Wars, Anakin Skywalker, he lived and was turned into a puppet for the Emperor. Kenobi told Yoda that he fought Vader and he defeated him again, and Vader died while Anakin lived. Yoda was very skeptical of this, saying that Skywalker lost himself forever after what he did in the Jedi Temple. And while Obi-Wan did agree with this overall, he told Yoda that the eyes he looked into on the Jabim moon were not those of Vader from Mustafar, they were the eyes from Anakin, hopeful eyes. And Yoda decided to trust Obi-Wan, then asked why he was here. 
Obi-Wan began telling Yoda that it's time for the return of the Jedi. With Vader out of the way, and more reports of Inquisitors being defeated by Jedi every year, the Jedi Uprising needs to truly begin. Obi-Wan was telling Yoda that it is their time. The galaxy is in desperate need of the Jedi. And Yoda considered this for a very long time. But eventually, he would agree. The Skywalker children would need another decade or so. But with Vader gone, there is an opportunity here. A void in the galaxy. A rebellion can be formed. And so Yoda would board Obi-Wan's ship as they took off for Alderaan. On the trip over, the two of them discussed plans to bring the Jedi to one safe haven. Alderaan would only be safe for so long, and so once the Jedi are back together, a new home for their return must be found, a base of operations for the Jedi Rebellion. The two of them talked about many planets, and ultimately Yoda decided that Kashyyyk may be their best bet. The Wookiees are excellent warriors, and the planet is under heavy Imperial occupation, so if they can just get through undetected, the Empire will hopefully not think they're dumb enough to hide there, but risks must be taken. So Yoda and Kenobi would reach Alderaan and meet Bail Organa discreetly in the forest outside of his home. The Jedi would tell Bail that their time to fight back has arrived, and they need to unite all possible Jedi. In order to do this, they will need to access a secure frequency so Obi-Wan can send out a message. Bail told them that this can be arranged here on Alderaan, and so within a few hours, Obi-Wan Kenobi was connected to a frequency that would be sent to any surviving Jedi still carrying their beacons. The message from Obi-Wan read like this, My friends, I'm here to inform you that it is time for the Jedi to rise and take the place of the Empire and the Sith. This message is a call for hope and a reminder to any surviving Jedi. We serve the people of this galaxy, and the people need us more than ever. While the temple has fallen, the light of the Jedi has not. The man called Darth Vader has been destroyed, and a void will be left in his place. I have sent coordinates to your devices. Come to them. Help restore the light in the galaxy. Obi-Wan ended the message and asked Yoda if he thought anyone was listening. Yoda closed his eyes and he said that their message was heard. They must be ready to greet this new Jedi Order. And the two of them would walk into the mountains and wait. Within a few hours, ship after ship emerged from hyperspace. Jedi survivors descended down into the mountains and things were looking good. Ahsoka Tano arrived and ran to Obi-Wan, giving him a big hug. Keller and Beck arrived with Grogu, which made Yoda quite happy. Cal Kestis, very much grown up now, came from Tantalor with the news of a potential safe haven planet. Quinlan Vos arrived and brought news of something called the Path, which Obi-Wan was now familiar with, and it helped get Jedi safe for many years. And a lot of those safe Jedi, around 30 of them total, arrived in the mountains. The last to arrive was Balin Skull, who was very close to abandoning the Jedi way but Obi-Wan had given him hope at the last second with this message. After the few hours, there were around 40 Jedi that arrived on Alderaan, but one final ship emerged, the ship of the Inquisitors. When Obi-Wan sent out the message, one of the Inquisitors still had their Jedi beacon, and they showed the message to the Emperor. In this message, Palpatine learned that Vader was truly dead, killed by Kenobi, and this did make him quite upset, but he always knew Vader to be a weak failure in the end and he told the Inquisitors that the Jedi are fools. Go handle this. Wipe them out once and for all. And so a group of five Inquisitors, led by the Grand Inquisitor himself, landed their ship and emerged to find Obi-Wan Kenobi alone at the bottom of a mountain. The Grand Inquisitor taunted Obi-Wan, asking where all of the Jedi were, or if it was just him. And he said that the idea of the Jedi Order is dead, and now he will die with it. But suddenly, the five Inquisitors were looking around as lightsaber after lightsaber, blue, green, white, over and over again lightsabers igniting around them, and within seconds, they were outnumbered eight to one. The Inquisitors ignited their lightsabers, preparing for a fight, but this fight would last no longer than a few minutes. Before long, the Jedi numbers were overwhelming, and the Inquisitors were forced to their knees, given a choice the Empire would never give them. Fight for the Jedi, fight for something truly good once more or die for the Empire. The Eighth Sister and the Seventh Brother would join the Jedi, while the others did not move. And so, Balin's skull moved in, cutting the final three down in one swing, to which Yoda was disappointed by, but Balin said if they're going to bring down an Empire, they must be able to do what is necessary to the Sith and to their assassins. And he was right. So from here, 
the Jedi Rebellion would meet with Bail Organa's growing rebel cells above Alderaan as they discussed their future. While the Empire is terribly strong in numbers, they are too fat and satisfied to see that, if given the chance, the galaxy will rise up around them. And the Jedi would soon gather together and head for Kashyyyk, where they would hope to build their own rebel base. What the Jedi did not know was that on Kashyyyk, a battle was going to begin. The Jedi aid was needed now more than ever, as in the towering forests of Kashyyyk, the Wookiees stirred as a plan was culminating. For years, the Wookiees endured the terrible Imperial occupation. Their forests were being burned down, countless Wookiees were enslaved or killed. But as the tyranny deepened, so did the Ember of Rebellion, smoldering within the forests. And this was the fateful day, as today was the day of the Kashyyyk Revolt. At the heart of the revolt stood a towering figure, a Wookiee chieftain known as Korak. And this day was all meticulously planned, each step calculated to undermine this occupation. Saboteurs would infiltrate key Imperial installations, disrupting supply lines and communications, while guerrilla fighters struck with precision, ambushing patrols, staging hit-and-run attacks. Kashyyyk was in unison, ready to do what they had to do to free their planet. And as the revolt was beginning, the Empire scrambled to contain the uprising, deploying legions of stormtroopers, burning down the forest without hesitation. And the forests would become a terrible battleground, where clash of blaster fire, the roar of Wookiee war cries, reverberated through the ancient trees. But as the revolt continued, the Empire's strength in numbers began to truly show. The Wookiees were being forced deep into the forests, and it looked like they may all go extinct, trying to fight for their freedom. When suddenly, a few new ships flew through the trees, and from these ships jumped 40 Jedi, landing on the ground, igniting their sabers together. The momentum shifted, Jedi and Wookiees united together in this moment and charged into battle against the Imperial troopers. It was reminiscent of the Battle of Geonosis, a battle that now shows another war is truly beginning. Ahsoka, side by side with Tarful and Obi-Wan, fought with great strength, while Yoda, Cal, Kelleran, Balin, and so many more ran past them, wiping out Imperials, not even allowing them to retreat. All Imperial troopers were taken down, and as the battle concluded, the Wookiees guided the Jedi underground into an already built bunker where hundreds, if not thousands of Wookiees were residing. They were eating and drinking from the great trees, set to survive for many years here, and now the Jedi were all welcomed in. It was a very well-hidden spot, and Yoda spoke to the Wookiee Council, informing them of this new Jedi Rebellion, and before long there was another new rebel cell, the Wookiee Rebellion. And this would only add to the growing rebellion across the galaxy, word of the Jedi Uprising was spreading like fire, and Palpatine did not act nearly in time to quell it. Now they were hidden on Kashyyyk, and the real fights could begin. And so they would begin, as the Galactic Civil War would truly speed up. Over the next three years, the Jedi Rebellion would be key in aiding the Rebellion across the galaxy as they took it back against the Empire. Days of uprisings became weeks, then months, then years, with the Empire soon losing some very important battles. On Lyanna, Cal Kestis, Kelleran Beck, and five other Jedi would lead a Rebellion fleet through the air and on the ground overwhelming the Empire, destroying many key facilities here. This planet was extremely important for TIE Fighter production, and the Jedi led the attack in disrupting this production in a huge way. On Coralag, Ahsoka Tano, Balin Skull, and ten other Jedi would lead this rebel attack, catching them by surprise, overwhelming the Empire. This planet was the home of the largest, most important Imperial Academy, where cadets would become loyal stormtroopers of the Empire. But one night, when all the young cadets were out of the building, the Jedi Rebellion would destroy this facility from the inside out. On Karita, home of perhaps the most important naval docking bay for repairs and refueling for the Imperial ships, Obi-Wan Kenobi, Quinlan Vos, and ten Jedi Knights, along with a fleet of rebels, went to battle and won, blowing up the docking bay, disrupting naval production in a huge way for the Empire. And on Kuat, Grand Master Yoda would take 20 Jedi and a huge rebel fleet from Bail Organa, led by Cassian Andor, to perhaps the largest battle so far of the Galactic Civil War. After an extremely long, terribly bloody battle in space and on the ground, the Rebellion was able to destroy a huge chunk of the Kuat shipyards, which the Empire used to create its ships. This was a huge win for the Rebellion. Now of course, they did not win every battle, but they won enough to move past the losses quickly. Around 10 Jedi would fall in battle over these few years, but they died 
knowing that the galactic powers were shifting. But perhaps the most important win so far came when all of the Jedi and around half of the Rebellion emerged above Geonosis, where the Death Star was in the final years of production. The Jedi Rebellion learned of this project from abandoned files on Kuat, and unfortunately for the Empire, it was not ready for action yet, and the shields were not operational, so the Rebellion poured in, destroying this battle station before it was ever truly ready. And this is when Palpatine knew that he underestimated the Jedi and their rebellion for far too long. His Death Star was gone, supply lines were disrupted, ship production was slowed greatly, and the galaxy was rallying behind their symbols of hope. So Palpatine began scheming a way to deal with this Jedi rebellion and show the galaxy that he cannot be defeated. And soon enough, he had his plans ready to go. On Kashyyyk, a huge celebration was underway after the destruction of the Death Star. The Empire was crippled, their cracks were becoming gaping wounds, and the Jedi were giving hope to a galaxy in desperate need of it. Things were very good, but they soon learned that they could deliver the true tipping point to the Empire. The Emperor himself, Palpatine, was finally leaving Coruscant, going to his homeworld of Naboo. It seems like the Jedi have finally forced him out. He was supposed to give a yearly speech here, but since becoming Emperor, he rarely showed himself to the people. But now, as rebellion was growing, Palpatine was off to Naboo to give his speech and assure the galaxy that this rebuilt society under his rule is still very safe and secure. But he was wrong, and the Jedi wanted to show him just how wrong he is. So the Jedi put together a plan to go to Naboo and take down Palpatine while he is giving his speech, live on the holonet, for the entire galaxy to see. And so very soon, the Emperor landed on Naboo to a huge crowd of people. It was a celebration of the Empire. Of course, very few people actually liked the Empire, but it was a mandatory celebration, with risk of being arrested for treason if you do not cooperate. So the people lined the streets, cheering as the Emperor prepared for his State of the Empire speech. As preparations were made, the Emperor's stage was on a cliffside, overlooking the huge waterfalls and the distant plains of Naboo, and in the skies, Imperial Star Destroyers were looking down on the planet, and the live switch was soon turned on, as Emperor Palpatine began to address the entire galaxy through the hollow nets. But in the city, the 30 remaining Jedi through their battles descended down on a stolen Imperial Naboo transport, then dispersed through the crowd, making their way to the Emperor's speech. They would destroy Palpatine for everyone to see, and the galaxy would unite behind them, and before long, the Jedi finally had eyes on Palpatine. In his speech, the Emperor was assuring the galaxy that the Empire has never been more safe, more secure, more powerful. Although there are radicals rising up, they will be quelled very soon. Palpatine said that these radicals were led by the Jedi, and the Jedi are nothing if not predictable. Ahsoka and Obi-Wan exchanged a look of concern now, as suddenly ten satellites emerged from hyperspace over the capital city of Naboo. In a booming voice now, Palpatine said that the Jedi Rebels are here now, watching him, waiting to kill him, but he is ready, he will always be ready, and he now demanded every single Jedi surrender, or Naboo, Kashyyyk, and Alderaan would be hit with orbital bombardments from this operation, Operation Cinder, and with a wave of his hand, Palpatine showed the strength of just one of these satellites above Naboo. The Jedi and civilians of Naboo turned to see a satellite fire a laser down onto the royal palace in the distance. It began to explode immediately, hundreds dead in one single moment, and Palpatine then ordered it to be turned off, looking to the cameras, saying that this is what happens to planets that harbor Jedi. Once more, the Emperor demanded the Jedi surrender, and they had no choice. It was surrender, or else three planets are bombarded in a lethal way. Thousands, millions would be dead. And so they all surrendered, being taken in front of the live holonet camera, put down on their knees. Thirding Jedi, including Yoda, Obi-Wan, Ahsoka, and Balin, were lined up now, as 30 Death Troopers got behind the Jedi, with their blasters ready. And as the Jedi were lined up, their chances of survival looking worse every second, Palpatine's voice was more powerful than ever. He exclaimed to the galaxy watching that the last of the Jedi die today, the Death Troopers will fire and eliminate them, and the Empire will finally be a truly safe and secure. But before Palpatine could say another word, a white lightsaber ignited from his back. Around the galaxy, 
from Coruscant to Tatooine, and everywhere in between. This is what the people see on their live screens. The Emperor, seemingly invincible, has a lightsaber suddenly go through his spine and out of his chest. His eyes go wide, and then the life fades from them as he is thrown off of the cliff behind him. In his place now stands Darth Vader, holding a white lightsaber. And all around Vader, Jedi Masters and Knights suddenly call their sabers to their hands, charging into battle versus the Empire troops here. As the Jedi fight the Stormtroopers, the people of Naboo unite as one, running into battle with the Jedi, bringing down the Empire around the city of Naboo. Everyone watching the Holonet sees the return of the Jedi, and as the troopers on Naboo are taken down, the cameras return to Vader, who removes his mask to show the ever-recognizable face, even after the burns of Anakin Skywalker. He flew up the side of the cliff, and he was here to save the Jedi. The looks on the faces of Ahsoka and Obi-Wan are a mixture of joy, confusion, happiness, relief, and so many more. Anakin is back. And Anakin speaks now, telling the citizens of the galaxy it is time to rise up, take the galaxy back from those who stole it. As he says this, the Imperial Star Destroyers and the satellites in the background of Naboo are beginning to be blown up as Captain Rex and his squad of a few hundred old clones have united around Anakin and are bringing down the Imperial blockade over Naboo for everyone to see. Once more, the Jedi and clones are saving those who cannot save themselves. And this spark from Anakin lights the final fire of the Empire. And so, as the Jedi were leading the people of Naboo to take back their planet, citizens, rebels, anyone who saw this message across the galaxy rose up suddenly against the Empire. And while the Empire did have strength in numbers, they could never stand against a galaxy united in hope. Planet after planet, city after city, the people took back what the Empire stole from them, either destroying them or forcing them into a cowardly retreat. On Kashyyyk, the Wookiees were able to destroy the Imperial blockade, and the same happened on Alderaan, Ryloth, Mandalore, Mon Calamari, so many more. On Naboo, as the Jedi won on the ground and the clones took down most of the Operation Cinder satellites before they could fire their bombardment, Obi-Wan watched three of the satellites jump into hyperspace together. And Obi-Wan looked around, making eye contact with Yoda and Anakin amidst the chaos. He turned to Ahsoka and told her that the three of them must go, so she is in charge of the Jedi Order for now. Ahsoka nodded, and Kenobi, Skywalker, and Yoda took off running. They had a feeling where those three satellites were being sent. They were going to bombard Coruscant. If Palpatine couldn't take over the galaxy with force, he would destroy it in his death. So the three of them got into a ship and flew through the battle going on in the atmosphere. Every satellite that did not escape was destroyed, and the Imperial blockade was being ripped to shreds. And Anakin, Obi-Wan, and Yoda jumped to hyperspace to chase down the final three of them. After a long trip, all three of them in separate ships, the three Jedi each headed towards a satellite. They tried shooting them down, but it was nearly impossible. The shields were strong, reinforcements in the air made it hard to even fire upon them. So the three Jedi moved their ships right up to the satellites, getting to an emergency door, and all three of them would move inside, killing the security troopers and getting to the control room. And all three of them would find that the firing sequence was locked and set to fire upon the capital city in 10 seconds. Palpatine's final move was to destroy what he could not have. And Obi-Wan called to Yoda and Anakin, telling them to aim the satellites at each other for the rebellion. Yoda and Anakin both agreed, and the three Jedi took the controls, pulling the satellite lasers at each other, and they fired and collided, obliterating all three satellites as Obi-Wan, Anakin, and Yoda went down in a heroic sacrifice, giving the galaxy one last hopeful light. On the surface of Coruscant, the people watched the explosions in space. It was like fireworks signifying the end of the Empire. Citizens from countless levels of Coruscant ran up the Imperial Palace, the Senate Building, the Imperial Hangar Executive Building, wherever else they could, bringing down the Empire as a united planet after seeing the Jedi save them. On Naboo, Ahsoka would get word of what happened here on Coruscant, and it hurt her to her core. The Battle of Naboo was won, and as she sat down now, the voices of Yoda, Kenobi, and Skywalker spoke to her, telling her they would guide her into leading the New Order. And so from here, for many more months, the Empire would be driven further and further back into the galaxy, until they were nothing more than an annoyance in the Outer Rim. They eventually would get into a new war with Maul's Shadow Collective, resulting in the death of Maul, Tarkin, 
Gideon, many more influential leaders opposing the Jedi Rebellion, and this rebellion would become the New Republic as it would be restored with Bail Organa and Mon Mothma superheading the movement. Kashyyyk would become a much safer planet for the Wookiees as they were finally free. Through the years, the four spirits of Skywalker, Yoda, and Kenobi would guide Ahsoka to Luke and Leia, and she would bring them into the New Order. She would train Luke, while Balin Skull would train Leia. All of the Rebels would come together on Kashyyyk, and the galaxy was finally safe from the Empire. And folks, that is our story for today. Hope you guys enjoyed. Before we talk about it, to join the lightsaber and Lego set giveaway, click the link in the pinned comment down below. It will be the lightsaber shown on screen right now. See it? Cool. And also the Tantive 4 diorama Lego set shown on screen right now. See it? Cool. Both winners will be announced in the video after I reach 50k. Let's talk about today's story. So, I wanted to do a video like this, um, what if someone joined the Rebellion. I've seen Penty Patrol do, I think, three or four of these, and I've always enjoyed listening to them, so I wanted to try my own, and I thought, why not just explore the path of the Jedi actually choosing to rise up? And I kind of thought, how would that happen? You know, they didn't do it in the original trilogy, they were waiting for the Skywalker twins. But Obi-Wan, I think, maybe just needed a final push to really get back into the wider galaxy, and that could come from Anakin Skywalker himself, Darth Vader, kind of dying away and saying that there's a void that Obi-Wan can take, and you know, they do that with Vader gone, Jedi can safely come together, kind of, and they ultimately defeat the Inquisitors. I did like having the part where Palpatine outsmarts them, captures them all with Operation Cinder, but having Vader as Anakin with the clones show up to destroy him, that was fun to write. Hope you guys enjoyed that, and yeah, just them all coming together as a rebellion to take down the Empire, so hope you guys enjoyed, let me know what you thought, and I'll see you in the next video.